Well, welcome everybody um, to the launch of uh, the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen report, Opportunities for Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies to Contribute to Clean Growth uh, in the UK. It's a pleasure to have you with us today, and I know that we have a global audience. Um, if I could just move on to the next slide. Uh, just briefly to introduce myself, uh, my name is Nigel Brandon. I'm director of the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Hub and Dean of Engineering at Imperial College. Uh, and in a moment, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Hub and introduce our speaker and panelist today. Uh, before I do, a couple of housekeeping points. Um, firstly, uh, if you wish to do so, you can go to your settings and choose subtitles in six different languages, Chinese, Korean, French, German, Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, please do so if you wish. Um, and secondly, to remind you uh, that you can submit questions at any point throughout the um, presentation today, uh, to, directed to a particular person or an open question, and we will curate them. Uh, you, as those questions are published, you can also vote for others' questions that you feel would be particularly important to have answered, and that will help us prioritise the questions that get asked. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about the hub. Got the next slide, please. Um, the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen Hub is funded through uh, the UK Research Council funding. Uh, we've been operating for uh, since May 2012. We're in our current third phase of operation and some numbers about the hub uh, and its outputs are shown there. Um, at the end of the talk, we'll provide the details um, to download the report that's being presented today and also uh, information about, how you, about how, you, how you find out about the work of the Hub more widely. As well as undertaking the research that's necessary to advance this field, one important role of the Hub is to inform key stakeholders of the benefits and opportunities around hydrogen and fuel cell technologies and to build a community uh, of, of researchers. And today's event is very much in that spirit. If I could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is the fifth um, white paper or fifth report that the hub has produced. Um, others have been on low carbon heat, energy security, energy systems, and an earlier paper on economic impact, which paid particular attention to transport. If anyone is interested in seeing those reports, they are available and can be downloaded through our website. Next slide, please. If I could have the next slide. Um, so I'll pass on to our speaker uh, and lead author very shortly, uh, Paul Dodson. I shall introduce Paul to you, uh, but also just to highlight that we have um, two uh, panel members who will be contributing and commenting on the report. Uh, that's Sue Ellis from uh, Johnson Nathy uh, and David Hart from e tech And again, I will introduce them more thoroughly later in the session and also introduce my co-chair, Professor Neil Shah uh, from uh, Imperial College, who will be curating the questions and also commenting. So I'd like to move on now and introduce Paul, um, who's the lead author of the report and will be speaking to you next. Uh, Dr. Paul Dodds is Associate Professor in Energy Systems, and if I could have the next slide, uh, at University College London. Uh, he specialises in energy systems modelling and led the development of the UK Times Energy Systems Model, which was used by the UK government to inform the UK's clean growth strategy. Paul leads on socioeconomic and policy research for the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen Hub. He represents the UK government at International Energy Agency programmes on hydrogen and energy systems. So Paul, thank you for being with us today and I'd like to pass um, the microphone over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. And good morning, everybody. It's great to see so, so many of you here for this report. So first of all, before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge the great contribution of my co-authors, uh, Will McDowell, Tony Velazquez and Gerard Fox, whose work I'm presenting here. And between us, we were interested in looking at four questions in this report. We wanted to understand how hydrogen fuel cell technologies might contribute towards achieving our long term energy goals in the future, both in the UK and further afield. We wanted to try to measure the research and innovation capacity of the UK in these technologies. We wanted to identify potential benefits and opportunities for the UK, 
And finally, to think about what actions would be necessary to encourage innovation in hydrogen fuel cells going forwards. So first of all, our first conclusion was that hydrogen could have a key role across the energy system in the future. Uh, this comes out of a number of reports, uh, and it's important to, to say that it's uncertain. So at the minute we use about 0.7 million tonnes of hydrogen each year, and that's primarily in industry to manufacture ammonia. By 2050, in a net zero scenario, UK consumption is expected to increase to between about 3 and 19 million tonnes, and that comes across a, a number of different uh, reports and a number of different studies. Uh, on this graph I've sh I show three net zero scenarios from the UK Times model that we run at UCL uh, as an example. All three of these scenarios meet net zero. Uh, the, what you can see here is the hydrogen consumption in 2050 and in the least cost scenario hydrogen is essentially only used where there's no viable alternative. So it's used primarily in industry for high temperature heat, for heavy goods vehicles, and uh, and these and fuel cells are purely used for heavy goods vehicles too. And we still see consumption increasing from 0.7 million tons now to about 3 million tons in 2050. In the second scenario, flexible tech, this 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 scenario is, um, considers a world in which all of our gas distribution networks are, con are converted to deliver hydrogen in the future. And people tend to adopt hybrid technologies, and by that I mean that they use hybrid heat pumps at home, which are heat pumps uh, powered by electricity with a, an add-on gas boiler for peak heating. And they tend to use plug-in hybrid fuel cell vehicles, which can be powered both by electricity for short trips and by hydrogen for longer trips. And, and in that case, hydrogen consumption increases to 9 million tonnes in 2050. In our third scenario, this is where we go all out and use hydrogen across the energy system. And this scenario, I think, most closely represents the existing energy system in terms of how the, the public use energy. So most homes and offices continue to be heated by boilers, but they're hydrogen boilers instead of natural gas boilers. Most vehicles have a fuel cell powertrain and are powered by hydrogen, but th those vehicles offer a comparable range and a refueling performance to existing petrol vehicles. And in this scenario, annual hydrogen consumption is 19 million tonnes. So that's quite a range. Now we do expect similar developments in other countries based on a series of reports, and we already see markets for fuel cells developing in a number of countries, uh, both for stationary applications, particularly micro CHP in Asia, and for transport, uh, cars and heavier vehicles. By 2050, there's forecasts that around 500 million tonnes of hydrogen could be used worldwide. So that's a very big potential market that's going to that's expected to develop over the coming decades. So what is the UK capacity in hydrogen fuel cells? Well, we went out and tried to find all of the businesses we could working in this sector, and I'm sure we haven't found all of them. But we did identify 196, and you can see here that they're based across the UK uh, from this map. And they come in a range of sizes. So you. That goes from large multinational companies, which would tend to have small hydrogen or fuel cell operations or divisions, and then a range of smaller and micro-sized companies, which have a greater or total focus on hydrogen and fuel cells. And we find that these companies work across the supply chain. So we categorize business operations into end use, hydrogen supply chain, electrochemical innovation, and services. The number of companies in each of these categories I think reflects the size of the market and reflects where the UK's traditionally had strengths. So we see a greater focus on fuel cells and electrochemical devices than we do on hydrogen because that's where the markets are at the moment. Transport applications have the, are the largest area, have the largest number of companies working in them, despite them not potentially being the most important use of hydrogen in the future according to the slides I was showing, the slide I showed a couple of um, on future demands, uh, or future projections. Uh, and thirdly, the UK is particularly strong in services in general in the economy, and I think that's reflected in this sector. So we see the largest number of firms um, in one area are those providing consulting and engineering services. We tried to measure the UK's strength in innovation through patents. And so uh, and at first sight, it's not a, a, 
not the prettiest picture, you might say, from a UK perspective. The UK has a, a smaller number of patents in hydrogen fuel cells than France, Germany, Korea, the USA and Japan. But, uh, but I think the raw numbers don't tell you every, the whole story here. Because if we look at the share of the global patents the UK has in hydrogen fuel cells since 2010, compared to the share of patents it has in all low carbon technologies, we, we find that it has a greater focus on hydrogen fuel cells. It has a greater proportion of global patents in hydrogen fuel cells. And the low number that we saw on the previous page reflects that historically the UK has invested less than competitive, competitive countries in all types of energy research. Now we can explore this a bit more by looking at a metric called the Revealed Technology Advantage or the RTA. And this measures the difference between a given country's share of hydrogen fuel cell patenting and its share of patents in all energy technologies. And so we expect that countries that patent disproportionately in hydrogen fuel cells relative to their average patent share are more specialized in hydrogen fuel cells and perform relatively better in that area. And, you, and when that's the case, then the, the Revealed Technology Advantage is greater than one. Now, in 2015, the UK has a higher revealed technology advantage in hydrogen fuel cells than any, other of, of any of these other countries on this graph. And it's increased substantially since 2010, which suggests that the hydrogen fuel cell sector is increasing in strength relative to other low carbon energy sectors. We also tried to un understand the strength of U UK universities um, by and we did that in a couple of ways. First of all, we, we simply looked at, at several research areas and looked at how many universities have research programs in each of those areas. And we found that in each of these broad areas, we have at least 10 universities with active research programs. We looked at publications. So this is, this is academic journal publications. And we can see here that the UK journal publications have kept up pace with the global community. But not, the number of publications isn't the own, isn't the most important thing potentially, it's the quality of the publications. And we found that the UK was had high quality publications. It has a very high number of citations re relative to most countries. It doesn't have the most citations because some countries such as the USA and China have much larger R&D investments and so they have a substantially greater output of well-cited research. Um, but the UK, what, what the UK does produce is very high quality. It's quite interesting to look at co-authorship of papers, I think. So we, we looked at who the academics worked with in industry in several different countries. We, we found that 12% of Japanese scientific papers have a business affiliated co-author, but only 4% of UK papers. And I think that suggests a weaker degree of industrial collaboration and basic research in the UK than in some other countries. We also found that German, Japanese and American academics often published with authors affiliated with automotive companies such as Daimler, Toyota, Honda, General Motors and Ford. But in contrast, prominent business affiliations of papers in the UK were involved with companies that produce fuel cell components or stacks such as Johnson, Mathy, Ceres Power and Intelligent Energy, which reflects where the UK industrial base currently is. Now we wanted to understand the business environment and so we went to our 196 companies that we identified and sent them a survey. And 32 of them responded. So this is, this is the main findings and the key barriers we identified. But we found that 66% of the UK respondents export goods and services into the, into the growing global market. So the UK hydrogen fuel sector really is export orientated. We found that 60% of the companies have joint R&D programs with the EU and a third of companies with North America. And we found that the majority of respondents worked with uni UK universities and generally had a high opinion of, of the research and facilities in those universities. However, there were a number of key barriers to innovation and growth. So, so first of all, the first one was access to finance, which was considered far easier to access in North, North America and East Asia than in the UK and in Europe. A second barrier was the very small UK market relative to overseas mar markets. So fuel cells are considered market ready, but the costs still need to be reduced further through scaling up production, bec uh, because that's practically how innovation works through learning by doing. 
Now, we do expect a market for bulk hydrogen to grow over the coming decade, and we already see markets elsewhere for fuel cells, but the small UK market is an impediment to UK companies who, who, who instead need to work abroad. Finally, uh, companies, and this was a bit of a surprise to me, companies noted a shortage of skilled labour in the UK, that the UK was perceived to have a fewer suitable employees to work in the sector, engineers and such like, compared to competing countries. Now, based on all of this research, uh, we came up with 12 recommendations, and we've grouped those into three groups of four. Now, our first four recommendations focus on developing UK markets for hydrogen fuel cells, both, by, both through financial support for the sector where appropriate, and by removing barriers. Our first recommendation is to consider how to create a market for fleets of vehicles. So we don't think private cars are going to be a strong early market in the UK. Uh, we also we already see a large number of electric uh, battery electric vehicles uh, being put onto the market. But fleets of vehicles, particularly those with heavy duty cycles that operate in urban areas, do offer a really good opportunity, we think, for hydrogen and fuel cells. So we, we recommend identifying niches using business cases that account for the benefits of having no air pollution and low noise from hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Local authorities are best, probably the best place to take this forward, perhaps underpinned by national grants. Our second recommendation aims to remove the chicken and egg infrastructure barrier. So fuel cell vehicles can't be used if there's no refueling infrastructure available. Now, if we build fleets, then you would expect there would be some sort of local refueling system, and perhaps that might be made available to people outside of the fleet owner, perhaps not. But a national network would give flexibility to those fleets. It would also enable fuel cell, heavy goods vehicles and cars to be used more widely. And we think the UK government is best placed to coordinate such a national network. Our third recommendation focuses on industrial decarbonisation. So there's increasing interest in using hydrogen in, for example, oil refining, oil refining, ammonia, methanol production, steel making, and other places where electrification doesn't seem to be a very good option. And, and we think that this is worth looking at and the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund that is currently be, uh, being set up by the government could examine these options. Fourthly, a fourth uh, recommendation is about a green hydrogen standard because hydrogen like electricity can be, can be produced from low carbon or high carbon routes. And that means a green hydrogen standard and a certification scheme is needed in order to enable the value of low carbon hydrogen to be reflected in the market and to justify any subsidies for hydrogen that might be provided because the last thing we want to do is subsidize high carbon hydrogen. Our second set of recommendations are focused on a strategic vision for hydrogen and for fuel cells. And we, we recommend developing a strategic vision to coordinate UK industrial development and innovation funding over the long term and to introduce a more active engagement process between government, industry and academia. Now, there's been a number of roadmaps and strategies uh, for many countries that have been published in recent years, including in the UK by Innovate UK. Um, David Hart, who's going to talk in a minute, was a key, was had a key role in that one. And, we, and these jet tend to include both, these tend to focus on both hydrogen and fuel cells together, as the sector has been historically been focused on transport applications. Now here we, we think it might be a good time to consider hydrogen and fuel cells separately. The first reason is that the UK is investigating a number of applications such as hydrogen in industry, where fuel cells are not likely to be used. And secondly, most fuel cell vehicles also use battery storage and, and fuel cells might be better considered in an electrochemical strategy, strategy that includes fuel cells, batteries and electrolyzers as appropriate. And we think the UK government would be best placed to, stay, to take responsibility for those strategies. All right, I'm going to talk about recommendation seven on the next slide. So I'm going to jump to number eight, which is about creating a hydrogen partnership to accelerate a shift to hydrogen energy systems in the UK. This Now, public-private partnerships have been formed to accelerate innovation in a number of sectors. And the idea is that they, they facilitate engagement between industry and other stakeholders. Uh, one example is the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, 
which was created in 2003 to encourage a sustainable transition to low carbon hydrogen and fuels. Another example for hydrogen, although it's a closed rather than an open consortium, is H2 Mobility, which was formed in 2013 to develop and share strategic insights into the commercial rollout of hydrogen technologies for transport only though. And we think a broader hydrogen partnership would be valuable to enable industry, government and academia to work together in order to plan and implement a hydrogen economy in the UK over the next few decades. Let me come back to fund uh, to funding in number seven. So businesses identified funding as a key barrier in the UK. And so and, and that's important because in the early stages of transition to a new technology, public investment in research and development is generally needed to support the development of new markets. So we've seen that some countries have in invested very heavily in hydrogen fuel cells. So, for example, I've heard that the Japanese any farm program has invested around 250 million dollars a year. For, for many years. And we were interested to see what funding was available in the UK. So we tried to identify funding sources. We identified a number. So first of all, we have uh, the EPSRC, uh, Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, which is a U UK research council, but that funds basic research. It currently has a, a portfolio of 11 million pounds invested in hydrogen and fuel cell research and uh, another 11 million pounds invested in training. But research funding has been reducing in recent years and there's now very few hydrogen research projects and almost no active fuel cell projects. Innovate UK is another part of UK research and innovation that f focuses at a higher uh, technology readiness level um, on R&D and businesses. And they've invested £33 million since 2014 for research and development in hydrogen fuel cells. Horizon 2020, the EU funding program, has funded both basic research and demonstration projects. And 53 UK organisations have received 77 million euros since 2014. More recently, the UK government has begun fu directly funding innovation programmes in hydrogen, uh, particularly for heating and for hydrogen production. And more than 100 million pounds has been invested. Um, one of the issues perhaps is that these, those schemes uh, are focusing on existing technologies and it's not clear how that how these will contribute towards developing the next generation of technologies that we might be using in 2050. Uh, finally, last but not least, is our is research and development tax credits, which almost all of the companies used and provided about half of the public support for R&D in the UK. They're, they're, much, they're more generic, but they're still very important. In the graph here, we looked at how funding was spread across the UK. As, as one of the key parts of the industrial strategy is place and trying to encourage industrial development across the whole country. Now, we, Yorkshire, London and the East Midlands have had the highest amount of funding, um, but it's worth saying that in Yorkshire and the East Midlands, a small number of companies have received a, a, a series of large grants and that, that has slightly skewed uh, this graph a little bit. I think there's two general issues that we need to consider for funding. So first of all, it's not clear how the UK pro government programmes are being coordinated with the UK research and innovation programmes from the EPSRC and Innovate UK um, to any extent, and, and the lack of focus on the next generation technologies in the UK government programmes, um, epitomised by the lack of academic involvement in those programmes, that we, we couldn't find any at least, that might be a missed opportunity uh, to try to include the identify and work on the next generation of technologies. Secondly, we don't know whether UK, whether EU funding or a replacement for it will be available after 2020. And this graph shows how important that's been to a number of countries across the UK. So this is my final slide. And I'm going to talk about the last four um, recommendations, which are on the focus on the development of a vibrant innovation ecosystem. So first of all, it's worth saying, what do we mean by a vibrant innovation ecosystem? Because uh, that might be a new term for some people. So, so I would define that as something which has, as, as where we have a sufficiently large skilled and innovative workforce, first of all, a diverse range of companies, and that those companies would interact both through competition and cooperation, sufficient funding and other support to underpin research and development, 
an appropriate regulatory and institutional framework and demand for products produced by the sector. Now, in practice, it's quite hard to identify what this means. And our recommendation number nine is to think about what critical would be in each, what critical mass would be in each of these areas. But, but as, a, as a general example, if, if for whatever reason a company in the sector goes bankrupt, um, in, a, in a sustainable and, vi and vibrant system, the people who work, the engineers who work for that company will likely find jobs elsewhere in the sector and the IP generated that by that company where, where it's useful will be picked up by other companies. So I think that that's, a, that's one way of looking at it. Our 10th and 11th recommendations are around institutes to focus on uh, long-term development of hydrogen fuel cells. And for these, we interviewed energy innovation experts about the case for a hydrogen specific innovation institution. We, we talked to people across um, government and industry and our interviewees in general endorsed the desirability of establishing such mission orientated innovation centers. They thought that they would need to have, they should have clearly identifiable long term goals and they thought they should have some degree of insulation from direct government control. But again, that's tricky because there's a balance between independence from political interference on the one hand and the need to stay close enough to government to have influence and relevance to policy developments on the other. In line with our strategic vision recommendations on uh, the previous slide, we're going, we, we suggest considering separate hydrogen and electrochemical institutes. So the Electrochemical Institute would look at fuel cells and electrolyzers and work closely with the Faraday Challenge on batteries. It might also include some battery research. Whereas the Hydrogen Institute would focus on the future use of hydrogen in the energy system, including hydrogen production, but like, apart from electrolyzers, including hydrogen storage, safety, combustion, industrial decarbonization, synthetic fuel produ production, and pathways for developing hydrogen systems, for example. A final recommendation reflects that the EU funding schemes that have underpinned all of these collaborations with EU partners and underpinned access to EU markets might no longer be available in, by the end of 20, after 2020. And that has an impact beyond the importance of the funding that we talked about in the previous slide. Because the, those, those collaborations are very important to the UK sector and those markets are very important to the UK sector. So I think it's worth saying that it's not easy, to, it, 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 it's, it's not sufficient just to replace that EU funding with UK funding. That EU funding has a wider role. I want to finish off by saying that this is really quite hard. I mean, doing this type of building up a sector like this and, and trying to use public money wisely and public resources wisely it is tricky. And part, part of the reason it's tricky is that there's always going to be some misalignment between the growth opportunities for hydrogen fuel cells in the UK, the optimal uses of hydrogen and fuel cells domestically, and the industrial and academic comparative advantage. So, and any sort of holistic strategy needs to acknowledge these trade-offs and provide the right support to remove barriers to innovation. But if it, manage, if it does that, I think the UK has the potential to develop a very strong and hydrogen and fuel cell industrial sector, which can meet future energy demands, both at, both at home and abroad. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand back to Nigel now. Paul, thank Paul, you very thank much you. indeed. And I can see a number of questioners coming in, and I'm sure more will come in. Um, over the next few minutes as we ask our panel members to contribute. Um, it's always um, traditional uh, when we launch these reports to invite two experts in the field to have a chance to read the report and to come and bring some comments as they see it, both insights from the report and, and the sector more widely. And I'd like to first invite uh, Sue Ellis to give her comments. Sue's going to spend a few minutes doing that. Just to introduce you to Sue, Sue's a based at Johnson Matthey, she has 25 years industrial R&D experience with Johnson Matthey, working on projects across the low carbon space around decarbonized hydrogen fuel cells, hydrogen storage, carbon capture and, and more. She's currently the research director for JM's efficient natural resources sector, which and the role covers research strategy, innovation excellence, new product introduction and the identification and development of future growth opportunities. 
And Sue is also chair of our hubs industrial advisory board and so is well aware of the hubs activities. Sue, over to you. OK, thank you, Nigel. So um, thanks to Paul and thanks for the hub for putting together this white paper, um, acknowledging it's one in a series of papers that have really helped communicate the opportunities for hydrogen fuel cells in the UK and more importantly, you know, as well to a globally, globally to a broad audience. Um, I've been chair of the Industrial Advisory Board for the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Hub now for about eight years, and it's really interesting to reflect on what's changed and how the narratives have changed in that time, and how the hydrogen and fuel cell sectors now have very distinct but overlapping pathways to commercialisation, and I think the report talks about this in some depth. So hydrogen is now broadly accepted as part of um, a key decarbonisation strategy, both for heating, transport, industry in many geographies around the world. Um, the UK's Committee on Climate Change stated that the move from um, an 80% decarbonisation target to net zero changed hydrogen from being an option to being an integral part of the strategy. And that's what we're seeing coming forward um, in the work that Paul and Yusuf have done here. So a lot of the challenges now are around really making this happen, uh, creating the markets and the mechanisms to get the really big, significant investments out there to make this happen. We've all been talking about the hydrogen economy for a long time. Um, the drive towards net zero really means that now is the time to make that real. So we're entering into a phase of learning by doing. So it's more important than ever that we continue to articulate the role that hydrogen and fuel cells have, the opportunities they bring for jobs and export opportunities in the UK, because most UK companies working in hydrogen fuel cells will be looking at the global market. Um, and we also need to build the supply chains that allow us to deliver these opportunities at scale. So just reflecting really on the role of academia as we go forward, um, there's been a lot of great innovative work over the years in getting us to this point. Um, and in launching a lot of the new innovative technologies. And going forward, academia will continue to play a very important role, but it might have different flavours going forward. So uh, we talk about the demonstrators, the pilot, the industrial strategy challenge fund work that's going on. Uh, there's a role for academia to support by de-risking those demonstrators with very specific knowledge gaps, um, continuing to innovate to bring costs down through materials and manufacturing. And you know, this is an opportunity that, that's going to be the future of our energy systems. So we need to continue to feed the innovation pipeline um, and bring out the step, step out technologies for the future. So the report talks about collaboration and innovation and co-innovation. That's going to be vitally important going forward. Um, this report suggests some of the options that might be possible to achieve this going forward. I think the challenge is going to be putting those into practice and, and moving them into reality. So with that, I'll hand over to David, I think. I think, Sue, thank you very much. I think I should just briefly introduce David and then um, he can certainly welcome his comments. Uh, so let me introduce you to David Hart. David is a director of E4Tech, a Swiss and UK based a consultancy company specialising in sustainable energy. Uh, he's responsible for E4Tech's fuel cell and hydrogen energy practice and has been an advisor, consultant and researcher on fuel cells and hydrogen energy for 25 years. He sits, or has sat on, on, on venture capital investment committees, clean energy company boards, and is the director of the International Association of Hydrogen Energy. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, and thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sue, for, for your remarks so far. Uh, and thank you, of course, to the Hub for facilitating this and pulling this all together. Um, I, I, I like the report. I, I wanted to first sort of commend the, the work that has gone into it and the, the detail and the analysis. And I think it shows a number of very interesting things, one of which is, uh, of course, the, the, the breadth and depth of what is happening in the UK. And that is more widely reflected globally. So we see, as everybody has mentioned, an enormous interest in hydrogen very broadly these days. Uh, fuel cells are a part of that interest, but I think there is a separation, as Paul makes the point, that there will be some uses which are fuel cells and not hydrogen, and some which are hydrogen and not fuel cells. I wanted to make some specific remarks on, on several of Paul's points, and I, and I like the recommendations. Um, 
I wanted to just comment on things like patents, for example. So I think patents are a very important measure of innovation in one way, but they're also a slightly blunt instrument. Uh, it's very frequent that either a country or even a company will be driven by certain incentives to do a lot of patenting. And I think that has been less the case in the UK in the past. And so there are probably some skewing of results which suggest that other countries or, or possibly companies are, are well ahead in patenting when in fact some of those patents are, are produced because there is an incentive to do so rather than because it's a useful patent. So many of the other metrics are also very important to consider. What I would also like to say is that, you know, there's a big strength in the UK in, in the engineering side of things. And we see a lot of big uh, industrial energy companies getting involved. We clearly have the underpinning manufacturing capability and we have the underpinning science capability. But I'd like to echo what Sue was saying, which is that right now, I think this is about delivery. This is about scale up. This is about pulling uh, innovation into the market, if you want to phrase it that way. So that fact that we have the engineering capacity to build plants, to put together large projects and complicated projects, not only in the UK, but, but in other countries in the world, I see is very important in informing the kind of innovation that's required. Again, that echoes Sue's point about uh, academic research supporting what's going on in industry, because I think as we scale up, we will understand better where exactly those knowledge gaps are, and whether they are in uh, improving materials or whether in fact they are in improving other aspects of performance, um, systems and controls, engineering, all sorts of other things. I think the some of the recommendations are, are, of course, couched in academic language and say it, it might be nice to consider that we should do this. And, and I would go a little bit further. I think it's imperative for the UK to to take a, a firm position on hydrogen fuels. There's a lot of industrial strength, there's a lot of academic strength, and we see this happening in, in other countries. We've seen Australia push very hard over the last year or two, particularly for the possibility of, of green hydrogen exports, but also local production of hydrogen. We're seeing a, a surge in Italy and the Netherlands. Germany has always been strong. Japan and Korea have always been strong. And I think it's incumbent on the UK government personally that they take a, a role and say, well, we, we, we want to be a part of this. We see this as a growing industry moving forward. Uh, work we have done also for the European fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking on, on value chains within the fuel cell and hydrogen sector pointed out very strongly that by taking a lead in development and in the kind of support industries, employment is extremely valuable in creating economic impact. Uh, and the UK, I think, needs to be thinking about both sides of that coin. The regional aspects are important. Different areas of the UK have different uh, boundary conditions, shall we call it. So Scotland has an enormous amount of renewable capacity, could produce a lot of green hydrogen that could be used in certain ways. There are industrial hubs around Teesside and around Liverpool and around other areas where you can see use cases developing or the Port of London. And I think those regional strengths are important to use independently, but also need to be coordinated nationally. And again, your, your points, Paul, about having something which looks like a, a, a coming together, a strategic position on this, I think are important. Um, the other thing which I noticed in the report, and you mentioned briefly in your introduction, um, and I think, I think is another area where the UK could play a strong role is in finance. So scale up finance is something which always comes up as a problem, it, not only in fuel cells and hydrogen, but in, in any new technology. And I think there is a role here, for example, for UK government to do perhaps guarantees of, of, of loans or to underwriting, you know, the underwriter, the, the taking the final risk out of some of the finance that is inherent in building new capacity or in building new engineering or building manufacturing plants. I think that might be one way. But of course, the UK has a huge finance industry and we have a lot of discussions at the moment with very, very big players who, who manage a lot of money. And they don't always, of course, have a say in saying, well, we, it must be invested in hydrogen and fuel cells, but they are in the position to be able to send signals through to the companies that do do that to say, if you invest in hydrogen and fuel cells, this will be used positively from a shareholder perspective and we, 
we've had that very discussion with some of these companies. So I think trying to unlock that finance is a very important area because that's what we need in order to take a, a, a next step in scaling up. And that, of course, will feed back through to understanding what you can do in the innovation side of things. My last point is I think, I think it's very important to have a strategy. I think that strategy also needs to have an owner. Um, we, as you said, Paul, were very involved in, in the roadmap that was produced for the UK a few years ago. Uh, I think that had a lot of very positive responses and, and it has been followed up in some ways. But I have to confess, I was faintly disappointed that it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really owned by anybody in government and, and therefore built upon and refreshed. And I would really like to see that as something that comes out of uh, any strategy development as well. With that, uh, very happy to take questions later, of course. Um, I'll hand back to you, Nigel. Thank you very much. David, thank you. Thank you. Sue, thank you. Um, so uh, we have about um, just over 10 minutes left for the, I'm delighted to see many questions that have come in. So the, the person with the difficult job of um, deciding which ones we ask uh, is my colleague, Professor Neelay Shah. Neelay is, uh, leads the systems research in the hydrogen and fuel cell hub and is also head chemical engineering, the Department of Chemical Engineering at Imperial, uh, authored extensively in this field and around the field of systems modeling engineering with a particular focus on hydrogen and its role in the energy system. So Nile, if I can pass over to you uh, and perhaps you can field some of these questions to Paul uh, uh, and the panel members. Great, thank you. So um, we have a lot of questions. Thank you. So I'm going to go partly by the number of votes each question had because I think it's very difficult otherwise and also to have a bit of diversity. So I'll kick off with a, with a question around exporting green hydrogen, which Paul mentioned. So the question is, why would the UK become an export of green hydrogen? Would it be able to compete with cheap solar prices in southern Europe, northern Africa, Middle East and so on? So Paul, that's probably for you because I think you, that was one of your recommendations. It was certainly something we thought about. I mean, per personally, my I'm a little bit skeptical personally. So, uh, and the, the reason is this: the this the Committee on Climate Change have looked at the cost of producing green hydrogen in the UK from renewables and compared it at the cost of with the cost of producing it in places like Chile and Australia and importing it by ship. Uh, and and the costs are quite similar actually when you take into account the shipping. And converting the fuel into something you can ship. Uh, and so that suggests that the UK UK industry would be competitive at producing hydrogen for the UK, but wouldn't be competitive at producing it for global shipping. Now, the second question is, could the UK produce hydrogen for sale in Europe, uh, where you might be transferring by pipeline rather than by ship in the form of hydrogen gas? And and I think the jury's still out a bit. So there's a lot of interest, and there's been a couple of webinars recently, um, particularly particularly in Scotland, about using offshore wind in order to produce hydrogen and, and export it to the continent. Now we have tried to model this in, in a European energy systems model, and, and offshore wind. While the UK does have a large offshore wind resource, it wasn't necessarily competitive with onshore wind in Europe producing the hydrogen directly. Uh, and I think, and I don't quite trust the numbers that we had in that model. I have to say, um, it's somebody else's model, and we've tried to edit it a bit. And, it and it's something I think need needs more work. But I think, I think, I think it's a possibility that the UK could have an export industry to Europe of green hydrogen. But I, I, th I think, I think a certain amount of scepticism is needed at this point. Okay, thank so, you. I'm going to then ask a question which probably Sue might want to kick off and it's not a specific I'm, I'm going to synthesize from quite a few questions that people have asked which is around blue versus green hydrogen nobody's mentioned CCS yet but the fact that we would need a lot of CCS for blue hydrogen and to what extent is that going to be being used in, in, in industrial and other processes as well. So could Sue, maybe you could kick off in how do you see low carbon hydrogen sort of evolving and what are the relative roles and proportions and timings for blue and green? So I think you need both. I mean there's a lot of discussion about blue versus green hydrogen and it reminds me of the discussion a few years ago around is it batteries or fuel cells and the answer is yes. Um, 
if you look at it globally, the answer to, you know, where, where we'll use blue or green hydrogen um, will depend on yeah, economics and geography. And in the UK, you know, we're quite blessed in that we have a situation where you can see blue hydrogen being quite viable because we've got a, a robust uh, gas network to dispute through. And also we have the carbon capture um, options offshore. So um, I think the answer is one of geography. There are some projections in you know, things like the Committee for Climate Change report, which show in different scenarios, the ratios of blue versus green. Um, most of those, those scenario, scenarios show a transition over time towards more green. Um, and that's particularly as the cost of renewables and the cost of electrolysis comes down. Um, the thing about blue, and for anybody who's not familiar with the terminology, blue is natural gas reforming um, by various advanced steam methane reforming type technologies with carbon capture storage. So blue, you know, the technology for that exists today at a scale that can be deployed with real impact very quickly because it's technology that's been used in the methanol and ammonia industries over time. And, you know, all of the scenarios around net zero um, say that you need carbon capture infrastructure anyway to decarbonize other industries. So blue ties into that and it ties into decarbonizing uh, clusters, large scale industrial clusters, whereas green at the moment is ideally suited for distributed manufacture. But I think as the supply chains and investments in electrolysis technology increase, both blue and green will have a significant role going forwards. Thank you. Uh, and we've got a question on, on bottlenecks, which again is linked to some other questions as well, which is really, particularly from a technological point of view, where do you see the bottlenecks that we currently face in the transition to a, you know, much more hydrogen based societies on the production, storage, distribution or end use technology? Maybe that's one for David. Thanks, Nilo. Um, it, it's, it's actually a very complex answer inevitably because it depends on which sector and which geography you're considering. I think uh, by and large there is agreement that most of the technologies are mature enough to be able to be deployed, whether that's a fuel cell or an electrolyzer or hydrogen storage or some other thing. Uh, for certain of those technologies, there are definitely bottlenecks in manufacturing. So, for example, one often cited uh, issue is in carbon fiber for high pressure tanks for going into vehicles uh, and that's a bottleneck which exists because the carbon fiber industry is limited for the quality of carbon fiber that's needed. Um, I think that industry is generally in a good position to solve most of those challenges if they see demand so they're, they're able to scale up companies like Toyota and Hyundai are already scaling up fuel cell vehicle production and have the supply chains in place to deliver those. The bottlenecks on the production side are very often in enabling the large scale projects to go ahead. And those are less about technology and more about financing and about public acceptance and about uh, making sure that all of the requisite regulations, safety codes and standards and other things are in place. So it's quite a diverse picture and I think you need to tunnel quite hard into any individual supply chain to understand what bottleneck it faces. My simpli grand simplifying assumption is if we are able to unlock more deployment, uh, we will be able to overcome quite a lot of those bottlenecks simply through the industry being able to unleash its own capacity for innovation. Uh, and I think that requires government engagement at a level where you have some sort of strategic thinking, some kind of joined up policy and some level of support which is uh, sufficient to make this happen. And, and that's not a few million here or there, that's that's significantly more. Thank you very much. Right, I've got one for, for Paul moving on to sort of more policy oriented things. So the Scottish government's currently actively working on a national strategy. Do we know if the UK government is doing something similar? And if so, when might we hear about it? Uh, the UK government is developing its hydrogen strategy at the moment. I'm not sure if it includes fuel cells or not. Um, it's an ongoing piece of work, which I think has been uh, delayed like many things by COVID-19, um, when all, this, all, all of the stuff get pushed onto other tasks. 
the last I heard was that they were think they were thinking to publish towards the end of this year or into, into next year. The first few months of next year. Thank you. And um, in terms of your recommendations, what was the rationale for splitting the hydrogen and the electrochemical activities? I mean, fundamentally, they're seen together, but I think that's because they're historically fuel cells and hydrogen have been focused on transport. And, and I'm not sure it's helpful when all fuel cell vehicles have batteries within them, first of all, and, and so the, the electrochemical side is important. There's a number of a number of the research challenges are similar for fuel cells and for batteries and for other and electrolyzers. So you have research challenges across electrochemical devices. Uh, and a number of the hydrogen challenges aren't really involved, don't really have an involvement of fuel cells, such, such as using hydrogen within heavy industry, storing hydrogen and such like. So, so, so I'm not sure that, the, while it has been helpful historically to put them both together, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. And, and maybe separating them will get, would give us a better, a, a different kind of mindset on how we use the two technologies, the two sets of technologies. OK, thank you. I think we're probably at our last question. I'll, I'll double check with Nigel when we've done this one. So changing tack again, there's a very interesting question about skills and I'll, I'll address this one to Sue again, which is you mentioned some concern about lack of available skilled people for, for this industry sector, meaning you know the, the sector as a whole. What specifically does industry need to fill this perceived gap? So you know what, what, what can we do, I suppose, on the training side to, to help with the skills for the hydrogen economy? So it is as we move into deployment phase, it is going to have to be skills across the whole range of technology. So I think historically we've always thought about, you know, high level R&D scientists, PhDs, postdocs coming into industry and driving innovations of the future. We will still need those. I think uh, Paul mentioned that because the funding in academia at the moment for, for hydrogen, particularly fuel cell technologies, is very low, you know, the, the number of students being trained up and having exposure to those technologies is low um, and you know there, there's a there's a pool for for bright minds out there and a lot of those people over the last five years have gone on to the battery side so I, I think we need to encourage you know some of those people uh, to to be coming uh, into the fuel cell space but uh, David mentioned that a lot of this is around engineering and deployment particularly as we go to installation of large-scale blue hydrogen it's going to be about a lot of the skills that exist in the oil and gas and the engineering industries and using those and bringing up our manufacturing industries as well to bring the supply chain so it's going to be everything from building around the apprenticeships right up to the highly skilled PhDs and R&D workers that we need for this and just having the visibility that this is an exciting vibrant place to build a career for a, for a young scientist or a young engineer, I think is really important as some of that gets implanted at school or university level. Thank you. N Nigel, have I got time for one more? I think you've got time for one quick okay. one. Let's, quick answer. let's bring up one which has been very topical, I think, in the last uh, 18 months or so, which is ammonia. So what do the panel think about ammonia as a hydrogen carrier and um, you know, what the, some of the opportunities might be then? Is it is it something you see as being part of the UK's national hydrogen strategy? Maybe David, you want to kick off with that? Yes, happy to. Thanks, Nile. Um, You're right. So it's a very big question at the moment, and I, I think I think the jury is out. So to borrow a phrase from Paul, um, ammonia clearly has a lot of advantages from a chemistry perspective in that it carries a lot of hydrogen in its molecule and uh, you, you can already transport it in existing industrial infrastructure. Um, its use in sort of outside of industry is, is, is possibly more problematic because there are clearly health and safety issues which need to be managed. Those, those are manageable, but there needs to be a lot of work done on there. Um, what we're seeing is, is interest particularly in two, maybe three areas. One is in the greening of industrial ammonia, so it's in using hydrogen from renewables to provide the feedstock to produce ammonia that, that is demanded anyway. And, and so that is a, a very good way of at least developing part of the supply chain uh, and, and, and of also using a lot of hydrogen. We see a lot of interest in whether this is one of the mechanisms for transporting hydrogen very long distance. Paul mentioned that 
there are discussions about liquid organic hydrogen carriers, about ammonia, about liquid hydrogen, about various other more esoteric ways of getting hydrogen from somewhere where it is cheap to produce to where the demand centers are. And ammonia is, is highly ranked as an option. And then there is direct use of ammonia actually as a sort of hydrogen substitute. So whether in power generation or in shipping as a fuel. And again, I, I think that may be potentially a very promising option. Uh, Decarbonising shipping is, is important. Uh, the IMO regulations are very clear and there is a strong driver and there are not many other options available. So I could see ammonia also being used in shipping as a direct fuel, as I say, kind of as a hydrogen substitute in the future. Great. Th thank you very much. So I'm going to pass back now to Nigel to wrap up. So thanks so much for your questions and sorry we weren't able to answer all of them. So Neely, thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, just a, a couple of quick comments from me to close. Firstly, to thank everyone that's participated today, um, particularly to Paul and his colleagues for uh, the report and, and Paul's presentation, to David and Sue for participating on the panel and taking the trouble to carefully read the report beforehand as well, uh, and to Neele for uh, fielding the questions and, and co-chairing. Um, the report will, is now available to download on the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen website um, uh, and you can get a copy of the full report from there. Um, the recording of this um, webinar will be made available to you via your sign-in links if you wanted to revisit uh, any of the content. Um, we do have another webinar coming up on June the 8th at 11 o'clock UK time uh, delivering negative emissions from biomass derived hydrogen. So that will link into some of the comments and some of the questions. So a specific focus on that. Uh, you're welcome to follow us on, on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter uh, and YouTube. Uh, the membership of the Hub is open to all. And so if you'd like to subscribe to the Hub and become a signatory to that and receive our newsletters, um, please do so. Um, there's a link, uh, a membership link. And if you have any queries, uh, there's an email address there. Um, h2fc at imperial.ac.uk. You're welcome to send those in to us. Thanks for your participation um, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.